morning, church. It's so good to have you here. And those of you who are in the pavilion, those of you watching online, thank you for joining us today. Best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell and his book, The Bomber Mafia, talked about a group of Air Force officers in the years before World War II who were sort of a maverick band wanting to do something that hadn't been done. This is what they wanted. They wanted to do precision bombing of a specific target rather than carpet bombing of a whole area or city. And it hadn't been done at this point. But they, they believed that if they could just uh, develop the technology for precision bombing and, for example, uh, blow up a military factory or a storage of oil tanks or uh, places where they store tanks or planes, that they could end the war sooner and thereby save so many lives. And so this was their dream, and they worked for it, and they went for it, but we just didn't have the technology developed by the end of World War II. For example, they might send 100 planes to bomb a specific factory, and each plane might drop 10 bombs, but of the 1,000 bombs dropped, maybe only one would hit the target. All the others were around. We never developed the technology for precision bombing. Now, fast forward to the present day. We can not only drop a bomb on a specific building, we can drop it on a specific room in a specific building, specific wall, that side of the room on a specific room in a specific building. Some of you know far more about that than I do. But the advances in military technology in the last 50, 60, 70 years have been astronomical. And what we have seen with the advances of military technology is true in every field of human learning. When you think about science, medicine, computers, communication, everything, when you think about the watch on your wrist doing things that could not be done years back, I mean, human learning and knowledge is growing exponentially. In 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. By the end of 1940, human knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Currently, human knowledge, human knowledge is doubling every 13 months, and we are on our way to doubling human knowledge every 12 hours, which sounds just almost incredible. However, with the rapid exponential increase in human learning and knowledge, do we have a concomitant increase in human character or human morality? We do not. We do not. If anything, we've got a regression when it comes to human character and morality. Consider just one area. Consider online connectivity and social media. How you can be in contact with anybody around the world at any time if you've got the right... Uh, uh, technology. But has that helped with human loneliness or depression? No, they're worse than ever. So we've got this exponential increase in human learning and knowledge and a regression in character and morality. By every me measure, our problems are growing worse, not better. Just to remind you, the crime rate, murder rate, alcoholism, drug addiction, human trafficking, abortion, teenage suicide, child abuse, abuse of women, divorce rate, family fragmentation, gender confusion, sexual depravity, mental disease, loneliness, depression, and on and on. And the problems are legion. They're not getting better. They're getting worse despite the increase in human knowledge. Now, with that cheery introduction, we come to our passage this morning talking about, and we're going to consider what the Bible says about human depravity in the last days. If you'd stand with me in honor of God's Word, I'm going to read part of our passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. It's a, it's a well-known passage that will be familiar to you. And this is what we read in God's Word. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, 
without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. This is God's holy word, church. Please be seated. While we are journeying through 2 Timothy, we are keeping an eye out for principles of Bible study and Bible reading. So in your daily Bible reading, I'm reminding you of some of the principles to follow. One of those principles is simply to ask questions of the passage, to ask questions of the text. Every verse you read, there are questions to ask about it to clarify. For example, the very first verse here you read, understand this, that in the last days, wait a minute, what are the last days? What does he mean? Does he mean just the period right before the coming of Christ? Or what does he mean? Well, one of the ways to find out what a phrase or a word means in the New Testament is to simply say, has that phrase occurred elsewhere in the New Testament? And this phrase, last days, as opposed to, you know, final days, the end times, things like that. But this, ta- this phrase, the last days, is used tw- two other times in the New Testament. And all three times, together with our passage, they're used the same way. The first time occurs in Acts 2, and this is what happened. It's Pentecost Day. Peter is uh, preaching his sermon, and he's saying, you see all of these uh, signs, these wonders, the rushing wind, the sound of the rushing wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in other languages. He quotes Joel, and in Joel's quote, he says, in the last days. And then he turns and says, this is what's happening right now. This is the last days. And so the last days actually begins the Pentecost, and it runs the entire time until Christ's second coming. The entire period is the last days, not just the, fa- the final few years. Now, in Hebrews 1, we see the same uh, uh, phrase used, uh, and, he, and he contrasts how God spoke in the Old Testament through prophets, how he now speaks in these last days through Jesus Christ. And, of course, that begins with the coming of Jesus, the first coming. So it's not just the last several years when there's this specific phrase used, the last days, but it's the entire time between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. In contrast to the Old Testament era focused on Israel, in the New Testament era between the first and second coming of Christ, focused on the church, the international church, uh, with the power of the Spirit, that is the last days. So we're in the last days. And that's why at the end of that passage that I just read, the last three words, we could read it. We said, avoid such people. Now, he doesn't say to Timothy, okay, those folks that live in the end times, they got to avoid such people. No, he doesn't say that. You, Timothy, you avoid such people. They're already here. Now, I know that's a little bit, uh, I thought, man, things were getting worse and worse as the, as the return of Christ. There are other passages that speak to that, and there is truth in that, no question. In fact, in our very same chapter, if you look down at verse 13, you see it, where we read, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceiving. It'll get get worse and worse, but it's already in the last days, and sin is rampant. It is everywhere. Don't be surprised at all of the human depravity, problems, challenges that we see all around us. God told us it would be so. Now, Paul begins this with some degree of emphasis when he doesn't merely say, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Rather, he gives a little preface to add emphasis. But understand this, in the last days. It's like he's grabbing Timothy by the collar, looking deep into his eyes and saying, Timothy, don't miss this. In the last days, there will be times of difficulty. There will be perilous times, dark times, difficult days. Sin will be rampant. Don't be surprised at what you see around us. And all we've got to do is look around, of course, and see. It is not only bad, but getting worse and worse. Now, at this point, uh, Paul doesn't leave us with generalities. <laughs> you know, it would be easy just to talk about generalities. Oh, it's going to be bad sin. And then we could go on and not feel, you know, any sense of a challenging specific conviction. But what we see here, and a number of times in the New Testament, is is that the Bible starts listing specific, concrete, tangible sins which step on our toes. 
And so we've got this long list of specific problems and sins, and uh, none of us are free of them. <laughs> and, and I just would encourage us, you know, th this is not about knowledge. This is about obedience, <laughs> not being hearers, but doers of the Word of God. And so as we go through this list, we've got to be asking, Lord God, what are you saying to me? Spirit of God, what are you saying to me in your grace and your love and your truth that needs to change in my life? Because I want to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, to just be sensitive to what God is saying to you. Okay, he begins in verse 2, listing specific sins, and he begins with these two phrases. There will be lovers of self and lovers of money. Now, at the end of the list, near the end of the list, he'll have two other similar phrases. He will talk about lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So three distorted loves and one proper love, the love of God. Now, in our sinful rebellion against God, rather than being lovers of God, so often humans, including we, are lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, thinking that's where we're going to find happiness and joy and soul fulfillment, but it is not so. It is a lie. Only in Christ do we find our lives. Now, to say that we are lovers of self, there will be lovers of self, that's essentially saying that we're living for self rather than living for, for God. We're living for self. I mean, what would that be like if you're living for self? Well, you'll be preoccupied and focused on your comfort, your pleasures, your dreams, your stuff, your agendas, rather than what is Christ's dreams for me? What are Christ's plans? What are, how, how can I serve Christ? How can I serve other people? It's living for self rather than living for Christ. That's lovers of self. And, and I don't know about you, but I can't get past the first one on the list uh, without just asking, Jeff, in your heart of hearts, are you really living for God or are you living for self? There's a lot of living for self in me. Jeff, are you really pursuing Christ's dreams for you or are you pursuing your own dreams for you? Have I come to the place in my life where I've decided it's not about me? It's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. Now, that's pretty countercultural when the whole culture is screaming at you, self, self, self. But we don't even need the, the, the culture screaming at us with a thousand voices a day because we got our own sin nature, our own fleshly tendencies crying out, pursue self. But the Word of God says, this is what you are made for, living for Christ. This alone will satisfy your soul. One expression of loving self the primary expression of loving self would be loving money. And so that comes next. Lovers of, there'll be, there will be lovers of self and lovers of money. One way we express our self-centeredness is by our greed, by our thirst to accumulate and self-indulge and spend in stuff, stuff that's going to make us happy. Lovers of money. And then if you skip down to the end of the passage or near the end of the passage, we come to that third phrase in the uh, evil trinity here, lovers of pleasure. Now, lovers of pleasure. I mean, is that not behind so much chasing after, you know, when there, there's alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual perversity of all kinds, even the endless pursuit of entertainment, amusement, and the inordinate attention of sports, travel, and so many other things. I mean, aren't all of those things in some ways a reflection when they are overdone in us, a reflection of lovers of pleasure? Now, don't get me wrong. Some of those things I just mentioned aren't wrong in themselves. I'm a sports fan. I hope the Astros crush the Red Sox this next week. Sorry, Roland and you other Boston folks around. But, um, but when we take a good thing and make it the main thing, it becomes a bad thing, and it will turn sour in our stomachs and cause pain. Is there anything in your life that looks like that? Consider again the Tim, Tim Keller quote, sin is not just bad things, but good things we make ultimate over God. And that would include house, career, savings, children, marriage, anything. 
that is ultimate. Only God satisfies the human soul. And all the other things become get, get good gifts as we receive them from the Lord. As Christ followers, we've got to understand what Augustine first said. You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Look around. It's true. And I hope you've experienced it. Only in him. Okay. The lovers of these things. In contrast to the loving God. Above all things, love the Lord. That's the antidote for every one of these things. To quote Augustine again, he said, love God and do what you please. If you are really loving the Lord, everything else is going to take, t- take its place. That's why our primary mission statement here, love Jesus. We're going to love Jesus with all our hearts. Fall in love with him. Not religion, not churchianity, but, f- but love Jesus. Okay, the next two traits, both revolve around pride. The next two traits in the list, he says, are proud There will be people who will be proud, arrogant. Then near the end of that list, a third term for pride, swollen with conceit. We see any of these things out there? If if you count the very first trait on the list, lovers of self, then then four of the traits really involve around pride. But but really, it's, it's, it's worse than that because every single sin has its roots in pride. Because pride is basically our rebellion against God, our independence from God. As the British writer George MacDonald, uh, uh, who influenced C.S. Lewis so much, as he put it, the one principle of hell is, I am my own. We can under, easily underestimate the, the, the depth of pride in the human heart, including our hearts. C.S. Lewis wrote more insightfully than anybody I've read on pride. Here are a few of his statements. He said, the essential vice... The, uh, the utmost evil is pride, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Or, pride keeps more people out of the kingdom of God than anything else. Every other religion in the world flatters its adherents and tells them they can accumulate, accumulate merit and will make the grade if they'll only try a little harder. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ says we not only cannot achieve our salvation, we cannot even contribute to it. Rodin walked in with this shirt, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And Well, it's from Ephesians 2, 8 about not something to achieve, something to, something to receive. Lewis also said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And, of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Pride is the mother hen from which all other sins are hatched. And who is free of the dark stain of pride? Again, we've got to come to the place where we recognize it's not about you, Jeff. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Lie low and exalt the Lord. Okay, next trait, abusive, abusive, specific trait. Actually, here it doesn't refer primarily to physical abuse, but mental abuse, uh, verbal abuse. It's really when we're demeaning people and trashing people. Any of that out there in social media going on? Abusive, right there in the list of, of sins that represent rebellion against the holy God. The next phrase, a little surprising, disobedient to their parents. Now, for those of you who are still in your parents' home, uh, that's not too many of you here, but uh, there's probably a few in the, in the place. This matters to God because when we, honor God, when we honor our parents, we honor God. When we dishonor our parents, we dishonor God. And I imagine most of us when we were young didn't do so good at times. But this matters to God because honoring parents is honoring God. Disobedient to their parents is right there in the list. Next, ungrateful. Ungrateful. Not being grateful to God. I, I am str- I've been reading the Bible for 50 years, 49 years actually, and uh, I'm amazed still at how often God talks about gratitude and about giving thanks. There is something close to, to what it means to love God and trust in God, to know that God is the source of all good things and we should give thanks. There is some sense of entitlement and ingratitude and unbelief and pride when we do not give thanks. God calls us, and everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Next 
trait is unholy. Okay, a few weeks ago, we saw that the term holy essentially means Christ-like. It doesn't mean rules and regulations. It means like Christ. And what is Christ-like? Well, Galatians 5, and 23 sums it best. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. What is holy? Love, joy, peace. What is unholy? The lack of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and on and on. Unholy. All right, the next one, heartless. We would not say heartless. We would say unloving, without love. That's what it means. That's the point. The unloving person is all wrapped up in self rather than focused out on others, concerned about the needs and the problems and the challenges of others, heartless. Now, the next one is unappeasable. That's also a term we don't use in normal, everyday English, at least in our circles around here. We would say unforgiving. By the way, Here's another principle of Bible study. If you would go to the New Living Translation, that's the term they would use. If you would go to the, uh, the NIV, that's the term they would use. One of the good principles of Bible study is at times, not all the time, consult multiple translations to get the meaning of a word or a phrase. Now, you, you really got a couple choices. You could spend years trying to learn Hebrew and Greek, or you could just check in about 60 seconds about a half a dozen other translations. Uh, and it's just as good, essentially just as good. Um, it's a good way to understand what the Bible is saying. So uh, here's the point. Unforgiving. There will be people who are unforgiving. These are, these are the kind of people who will not let go of a grudge, will not let go of, of anger, resentment. They are, they are drinking the, the, the cup of uh, bitterness and enjoying it, and they're thinking that the other person who har- harmed them is going to die because they're drinking that. And they're the ones that are dying. Jack Deere had a great message on forgiveness two weeks ago. If you didn't hear it, I encourage you to listen to it. Uh, unforgiveness, every Sunday morning, we, we, we pray together to God, Father, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is part of loving Jesus, that we choose to be forgivers. Biggest challenge, harder challenge, but... Most important challenge of love. Slanderous gossips, malicious gossips. You know, that becomes so, uh, so much a part of our culture and our way of life, we hardly notice it as sin. But it is. It's on just about all these kind of lists. Gossips, tearing down, demeaning people. The next one, without self-control, that is, just excusing the lack of self-discipline just to pursue your own desires. Brutal, cruel, savage, violent, as is glorified in so many movies. But, but the next one, even more so, not loving good. That is, if you're not loving good, you, you kind of take delight in evil and sin. Now, am I, am I missing something, but, but sort of taking delight in what's wrong and what's sinful Is that not about 90% of television today? Am I missing something? About 90% of television and movies uh, work it so that you want to find some delight in in the wickedness. Not loving good. Treacherous. Treacherous simply means betrayal. It's the opposite of being loyal. Loyal to your spouse. Loyal to your family. Loyal to your friends. Loyal. The opposite is treacherous. Disloyal. Reckless impetuous or rash that's that's when we are are talking and taking action before thinking anybody else do that some engage the mouth before we engage the mind the next three on the list we've already looked at earlier swollen with conceit lovers of pleasure not lovers of god there's one more on the list we come to it in verse five it's an important one And it's this, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Holding to a form of godliness but denying its power. Oh, so Paul has been talking about people in the church. They've got a form of religion. They've got a form of churchianity. They've got a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. They are apparently knowledge-based. They're all about being hearers of the word rather than doers of the word. 
they are, you know, kind of last week when I was talking about we want to be a church that's full of the Word and full of the Spirit. We want a convergence of Word and Spirit because we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not practical atheists just wanting a little bit more theological knowledge. But we want to see the hand of God work. And so we believe that God is a prayer-hearing, miracle-working God. Don't we, Tanya Ellisor, wherever you are? Others who've seen God bring healing to them lately. Uh, And so we ask God for God-sized things. All right, that's the list. That's the final one on the list. Those who hold to a form of godliness but deny his power. Now, at this point, he simply concludes that section by simply saying, avoid such people. Timothy, you, and you teach others, but for those people in the church who live like this, you avoid such people. He's not saying to avoid non-Christian people out in the streets of Ephesus, because if you had to avoid people like this who are sinful uh, in the world, you'd have to leave the world, wouldn't you? Had to avoid yourself. But we're talking about people who live this way, who are characterized this way. If they're in the church, don't just carry on as if uh, no problem. If, if, uh, the, 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 if that's pleasing to God, if that's not a big deal to God, don't hang out with such people. Rather, be a friend of people who are walking with the Lord too. Now, non Christians, absolutely. Jesus was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. But in the church, uh, don't choose to hang with people who live like this. Choose to walk with people who walk with God. The principle really is stated best in, in, in Proverbs 13, 20, where we read, He who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, if you're raising teenagers right now, that ought to be near the top of your list. He who walks with wise people is going, to be, is going to become wise. The companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, but that's not only true of our teenagers. You're going to be, in five years, you're going to be largely who you hang with. Are you a companion of fools or do you, you hang with the people who are chasing after Jesus? Avoid such people, he says. Now, at this point, let me just pause. I'm fascinated in a list like this about the last days, there is not one mention of the spiritual battle. And that suggests to me that, yes, the spiritual battle is real. Of course it is. And we're alert to it. But don't excuse everything or blame everything on Satan. You also have the flesh and human depravity. And you also do battle with your own sin. We do battle with our own sin. Let's don't excuse everything. Now, let me be clear. From Genesis to Revelation, we've got the spiritual war. In fact, right before verse 1 of our passage, he's talking about the spiritual war. Chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, he says, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Yes, the battle is real. Spiritual war is there. But don't excuse everything and blame everything on, I'm just, you know, that's from Satan. You've also got human depravity and flesh, and God calls us to say no to such things. C.S. Lewis wrote of the time when he first became aware of the extent of his human sinfulness. He said, from the time I examined myself, for the first time I examined myself, and there I found what appalled me, a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. My name was Legion. But the good news, the good news, the Bible says this, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. This is a dark passage in many ways, reminding us of the extent of our depravity, the extent of our sinfulness, and how displeasing and grievous it is to God. But all of us in our sin can turn to a Savior and rest in a Savior. And the Bible tells me that the blood of Jesus is bigger than my sin. However big my sin is, the grace of God is bigger. The blood of Jesus, as Luther put it, one drop of Christ's 
blood is worth more than heaven and hell. It's worth more than the universe. And it's big enough to cover my sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, in the last few verses, we'll be quick on those. Timothy turns, I mean, Paul turns to talk about false teachers and to warn Timothy. They prey on people. Be alert. And church, of course, there are not only false teachers and uh, false prophets in the first century church, but also in the 21st century church. There are those who will uh, distort the Word of God, such as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. There will be false teachers even within classic churches who will preach the prosperity gospel, salvation by works, say there is no hell, things like that. There will be people today who will go with what's popular and fashionable rather than what's biblical. They, they will uh, say that, uh, you know, distort what the Bible teaches about marriage, about sexuality, about Jesus being the only way to God, and much else. And we've got to decide, am I going to go with what the culture is saying or am I going with what God is saying? Every word of culture uh, will not last, but these words will last forever. This is the treasure. This is the Word of God. This is what Paul says about the false teachers, beginning in verse 6. For among them, avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. God will one day reveal every secret of the human heart. And their folly will become plain. Avoid such people. Don't give them your attention if they distort the Word of God. All right, church. What's God saying to you this morning? What's the Spirit of God putting His finger on in your life? As we've gone through specific, concrete, tangible sins, where is the Spirit of God saying to you, this needs to change? You need to surrender this to me. This is a blind spot. Now, if you've gone through that list and you don't feel like any of those really apply to you, you might have a bigger problem. <laughs> you've got some real denial going on, either that or psychosis. <laughs> What's the Spirit of God saying to you about these things? In the last days, our days, there will be lovers of self, loving money. People will be proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, gossiping, without self-discipline, brutal, not loving good, but evil, disloyal, rash, and reckless, swollen with conceit and boasting, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Where's God speaking to you? I found it convicting studying for this. But I remind us, However big our sin, Christ's grace is bigger. Because on that cross, the whole reason Jesus came was to have his life culminate in being crucified, nailed to a Roman cross, and dying in your place, my place. And as he was dying, at a certain point, this is what God did. God the Father took all of your sin, every word, attitude, action you'd ever do, every sin, and he placed them on Jesus, and he bore your sin. Jesus paid it all. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Where sin abounds, grace superabounds. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And because of that grace and love, I want to please him in my daily life. 
And by the power of God, the power of the Spirit, I can say no to those sins. I don't have to live in the slavery of those sins anymore. I can say yes to Jesus, the power of the gospel. Church, this morning, say yes to Jesus in your daily lives. Stand with me, please. Friend, if you're not, not sure where you stand with God, the, the, the biggest act of human pride is defiance against God and our need for a Savior. I beg you, humble yourself and breathe the prayer, O oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He'll hear that prayer. He'll answer that prayer. He'll give you life forevermore forgiveness of sin bless you Lord I thank you for a congregation so many people here just seeking hard after you knowing we're flawed but knowing your grace is bigger and because of that Lord we want to please you and experience all the life that you've got for us bless these people as they seek after you Lord, with all our hearts, we pray in Christ's name.